I'm Stefan Frank, Director of Social Media at the Wharton School. Um, I'm really excited to be hosting a conversation uh, with Nikki Rappaport of Calva Grill and with Nancy Ryerson from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. We're going to talk about community building and how a tool like Percolate can help facilitate that. Um, before we get started, just a quick show of hands. How many people in the room are Percolate clients today? So about a third of you. Great. So for those of you who are clients, I think you may hear some great case studies about how uh, these teams are using Percolate. And those of you who aren't and are thinking about it, considering the tool, um, hopefully this will inspire you to learn more. So I'm just going to talk really briefly about Wharton's transition. Our transition from an outbound or marketer-centric to an inbound or customer-centric content strategy. And how the inbound strategy has really helped us develop and strengthen our community one person at a time. So we got to go back to 2006 when marketing was kind of like fishing. And you'd throw your message or your ad into this dark ocean and you couldn't really see the fish. And therefore, you didn't really know what lure or what bait to use. But nevertheless, we figured if our content was really amazing, that the fish would bite anyway. So we invested in own media. We developed things like newsrooms and brand studios, which some of you were in this room just a few minutes ago heard a lot about. But it was hard. And it was pretty expensive. And at the end of the day, we just ended up fighting each other uh, for attention. And platforms like these, they took notice. And they developed algorithms that delivered only the most re relevant content and the volume metrics we used to care so much about, reach and impressions, suddenly had a lot less currency. So the question about ROI started to creep up everywhere. You remember, your inbox was stuffed with webinars about proving social ROI. They were once a week. So as marketers, we took a step back. We went back to the drawing board. We started to look at all the assets we were creating and started to think a lot more critically about their value. And more importantly, how our customers were interacting with us, where they were in their journey. In order to meet that sweet spot of relevant content at the right place in the right time, it only took a little bit of data. But the results were incredible. And at that point, we could start to not only see the fish, but we could start following the fish around. So bringing us back to today, the idea of quality content at the right time, on the right channel, table stakes. Apologies for the buzzword. But it's true. The real question is, so what? What's next? How can something like inbound marketing create brand loyalty or you know, a repeat customer, or in this context, help you build community? In a moment, we're going to hear two case studies from Kava Grill and Michael J. Fox Foundation, two organizations that really understand the value of a personalized and seamless user experience online and offline. But first, I'm going to do a little word association. What do you think of when you think of Warden? Shout it out. Business. Business. Pen. Pen. Smart. Smart. Elite. Executive. Executive. You guys are being way too kind. Come on. <laughs> There's an election going on. Trump. No one, Trump. Trump. Anything else? Sharks. Sharks. Expensive. Now we're getting somewhere. Somewhat old school. Huh? Somewhat old school. Somewhat old school. Perfect. <laughs> well, in reality, what Warden is is a community of moms, entrepreneurs, supporters. We're inclusive. We're adventurous. We're generous. We're collaborative, and we're really fun. But how would you know that? How would anyone know that? Moreover, how would anyone who's considering their education at Warden know that? Well, it starts with your audience. We have to understand what content has value for which segments. So with personas, semi-fictionalized representations of our students, we can understand what content is going to be important to them at what moment in their journey. But we have to know them as people, as individuals. We have to know their goals, their aspirations. We have to know their pain points, their objections to Wharton, and what solutions we have to offer. 
And as marketers, we have to keep these attributes top of mind all the time. And Percolate is a tool that helps us govern those assets, those attributes, those values in every single campaign that we do. So when we set out to create a landing page, it speaks to a, a student's interest in social impact, for example. Or we write a blog post, this one actually is written by a student, that authentically represents the experience of seeking an internship, even when it doesn't work out. Or videos like this, which help our students see the resources that are available to them when they graduate that they may have overlooked or taken for granted as a student. And of course, all of these resources, they have to be delivered at a time and in a way that's beneficial to them. And of course, all along the way, we have to continually highlight and share and celebrate their success, their interests, their experience, because we know that happy and fulfilled students become wonderful brand ambassadors. We also know that happy and fulfilled families and spouses and friends are also incredible brand advocates. So we have to empower them to share so that the Wharton brand and the Wharton experience can be shared with a wider community. But no community more important than this one, which is truly a global network of incredible people who continue to give back and pay it forward to the incoming classes and to each other. Because when that network thrives, our brand thrives, and in some ways, the world thrives. So that's just a little bit about inbound and community building at Warden, and we'll get more into it in the Q&A. But I want to turn things over now to Nancy from the Michael J. Fox Foundation to talk about community building at her organization. Hey, thanks for the introduction. So the Michael J. Fox Foundation has one goal, and that is to cure Parkinson's disease. There is currently no cure for Parkinson's, and the best treatments are the same ones that have been around from the 1960s. So along the path to finding that cure, we're also really committed to improving therapies to make life better for people just in their day-to-day -day lives. But we've realized, you know, we started back in 2000, and we've realized along the way that it's going to take more than just fundraising and giving money to really great researchers to, to find that cure and to reach that goal. So there are a few different pieces that are going to go into it. One of them is finding really passionate grassroots fundraisers. We saw that there was this passion and interest in fundraising at the grassroots level, and that's grown into our Team Fox program. People plan all kinds of really creative events like pancakes for Parkinson's, all kinds of fun stuff. And it's also really important to get people involved in clinical trials. So these are trials that are testing out those new therapies, seeing if they work, seeing if they actually succeed in slowing down the disease. And we need people with Parkinson's as well as control volunteers. So spreading the word about that is also really critical to our mission. And finally, we also host community educational events. So those introduce the Parkinson's community to resources that are available to them for living uh, their best life with the disease and also connecting to those clinical trials. So our question was, how can we reach all of those goals, increase all of those conversions, while also connecting with a wider swath of the Parkinson's community? So one million people uh, in the United States are living with Parkinson's. And of course, all of those people also have friends and family who very likely are interested in getting involved in the cause as well. And with Percolate, we've been able to expand our reach, especially on social media, all while keeping up the same brand voice. And our brand voice is empathetic, but also very intelligent. And we really see ourselves as the source for Parkinson's news that's scientific. And we started this process by listening to our community. We did a really cool uh, text analysis of six months' worth of Facebook comments. People comment all kinds of stuff on our Facebook from tell Michael, I have a cure for him, like send this to him. Those are weird, but we also <laughs> get a lot of like really personal, really great stories from our community. 
So based on that, we were able to divide up our audience into kind of these four segments. So there are people with Parkinson's, then friends and family of people with Parkinson's who want to keep up with the news around it, then uh, Parkinson's caregivers, so those are generally adult children or spouses of people with Parkinson's who provide care usually in the later stages of the disease. And then there are also people who just love Michael J. Fox and Back to the Future. So after identifying these segments, we began planning out personalized content that would really speak to each of them and help drive traffic to our website uh, and also help us acquire email addresses. So this is an example of a percolate calendar that we have and how we plan out all of our different promotions around webinars, events, other upcoming events, and we see that we're spacing out our content in a way that's engaging. So we don't want to go on Facebook every day and say, give us your money, because people are not going to respond well to that. So Percolate allows us to really give context to those larger asks, whether it's donating, starting your own fundraiser, or getting involved in a clinical trial. This is an example of a few days' worth of content during Parkinson's Awareness Month, which is one of our biggest months for creating content and engaging with our community. So on the first day, we put together a nice Facebook album of all of these different supporter badges. You could change your profile picture to one of our badges or just share it. And we also have a link to, our, to join our email list. And that's a, a very important goal for us because we find that email is our best converter ultimately for our calls to action. So that's kind of a connection between social and, and another channel. Uh, so then the next day, we shared a piece of content that had actually been sourced from the community. So you always hear about Awareness Month, but what should people really be aware of? So we asked our community what they felt like were misconceptions about Parkinson's disease. And then we took those comments and created content from it, shared it back to the community, and it performed really well. It drove nearly 8,000 visits to our website and just got a ton of comments and engagement. And it also showed our community, we know what it's like for you. You know, we're reflecting back your voice and your experience in our content. So then finally, on April 9th, after we had given context around our, our need for funds, we did make a donation ask. And it ended up uh, performing a good bit better than that kind of content generally does on Facebook, which was really exciting to see. Definitely about two or three times as much reach, a lot more engagement than average. So providing that content, that context made a, a big difference. This is another example of a piece of content. And this one appeal, appeals more to that caregiver segment that I mentioned. So they have very specific needs that we, we work to address. They're, Caregiving is very stressful. It can be just a very emotional experience. So we asked our community, what do you feel like are myths about caregiving that your friends and family just don't understand? So then we turned those responses into a blog post that was nearly five times more engaging than our, our average piece of content. This piece is a great example of putting one of our calls to action within the context of a personal story. So this man lives with Parkinson's. He ran his first marathon, I think, in 20 or 30 years. This is after he was diagnosed. And he's also a Teen Fox member, so he's a grassroots fundraiser. So this content was people could relate to it. It was informative because exercise is actually really helpful for Parkinson's symptoms. And it also introduced the community to getting involved in Teen Fox and, hey, you can run a marathon and support the foundation. And uh, so while we've been creating all of this new content and you know, we grew our team, and we re we're really reaching so many more people, we wanted to make sure that our content was still accurate. A lot of misinformation floats around the internet about Parkinson's disease, unfortunately, and a lot of people will come directly to our Facebook page and say, hey, I, I saw this on whatever site, is it true? So it's really important to us to make sure that all of our channels are as scientifically accurate as possible. So we use the Percolate commenting tool to connect with the, our content creators on the communications team to make sure that nothing has been lost in translation as we're packaging this scientific information for a lay audience. 
So all of this content building, social outreach, really made a big difference for us. We saw a lot of growth in social, our email list, great increase in our website visits. And we really see those three factors all also lifting up our donation goals. So we also saw a 25% increase in that area. I think our takeaways, you know, even though we're a nonprofit and we do have an interesting story, we have a celebrity founder and Parkinson's you know, is a very emotional topic, we've learned that our content performs best when we're not just talking about ourselves when we're really thinking about what is daily life like for our audience, what information do they need, and how can we show them that we're listening. And we also show that by community management, which we also are able to use Percolate for. We have a, an off-site community manager respond to those comments. And we always say, thank you for sharing. You know, It really means a lot to us that you're a part of this community. And also just making sure that everything stays as accurate as possible so we remain that source of the best Parkinson's information as we work towards that cure. Thank you. Hi everybody. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit to talk about something maybe a little bit more lighthearted. We're going to talk about food for the next um, couple minutes. Um, I'm Nikki. Um, I'm a foodie, um, but I prefer the word food nerd. I think that's a better uh, descriptor for what I do every day. So I um, have a background in digital marketing and storytelling and writing and event planning, um, all sorts of things. But at heart, I love food and I have a great opportunity to be able to share this and get to be a food nerd every single day at work. This is just me with a bunch of food. Um, and uh, so I'm the director of brand and marketing at Kava. Um, Kava is a uh, Mediterranean culinary brand that uh, brings a healthful, vibrant food to a lot of different communities. Um, I would assume that the number of the people in the room here who know Kava is a little bit smaller than the, the WeWorks and the Levi's and things like that. But I would love to know if you've heard of Kava, Kava Grill before. Oh, good. That's great. So we have uh, fast, casual restaurants in the DC area. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, we just opened our first one in New York City about a month ago, and we also sell our products, our dips and spreads, hummus, um, our signature crazy feta in Whole Foods markets in those uh, regions as well. Um, I met Kava three years ago um, when, and was brought on really as the first corporate employee to start building out what our brand was. And this is what our brand looked like uh, when I came on board. Uh, not so enticing, but we had really great food, uh, we had great people, we had a great story to tell, uh, we had people who loved our food, but we didn't have a whole lot to show for it. Um, these are just uh, a few pictures from Instagram that I, I love, this one like um, of mint, <laughs> great photo. <laughs> um, so what was our challenge three years ago when I, when I came on board? Um, I wanted to build a community the, of foodies, people like me who just love food, uh, who seek vibrant, healthy, and easier lifestyles, and who want to share it too. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of our journey of how we, how we got there and, and the steps that we're still taking today to do that. So the first thing really is defining the brand. Um, we have to get the product right and we have to get the experience right. For us, that really started with our menu, with our food. Uh, if you are a brand manager here in the room, you oversee marketing and brand, get involved in the product. If you're not already involved, you need to find a way to get involved. Um, we every day spend um, our time at work uh, selling this. We also need to be involved in creating it too. And so I am very much on the ground on deciding what our menu is, what menu innovation is, um, and then how do we present it out to the world. So that includes you know, the actual roasted vegetables that we um, change out every season, but also what does it look like and how do we present what a kava bowl looks like so that you know when you would take your photo and you post it on Instagram, what a kava bowl should look like too. Um, and that also includes our products um, as well. Um, and the experience as well. So not just the food, which is really where the heart of it is, but also our restaurants as well. From the store design to how we approach customer service, um, the experience. Um, one of the things that I um, try to communicate a lot, uh, to, especially to um, our greater community, um, 
at, at Kava is that a brand is not just a logo, it's not just a Facebook post, but it's really a feeling and an experience. And so every single touch point that we have, um, whether it's somebody walking into a restaurant or speaking to a team member um, or engaging with on social, that is all part of our brand. And then lastly, creating a brand that looks as good as a food. So all of this real life experience, the real food, the real restaurants need to be able to translate into something that looks good too. And so that translates to everything digital, um, our photography, our graphic design, um, and merging those things with our physical environment as well. We invested in photography really on, early on um, and that helped pave the way for who we really wanted to be. Step two, create a lifestyle. So these two points, creating content and making it personal, um, this is something that we used really early on as a tactic when it was just me doing our marketing and then me and one other person doing our marketing. And now that we have a team of people, this is a tactic that has sustained um, something that we can really build upon. Uh, so we do that through several ways. One, I like to joke that we're a, a restaurant that also wants you to cook at home. And so Kava is a place where, yes, you can come and you can eat your work lunch um, a few days a week. But we also know that you are you love food and you also cook and you also entertain and we want to give you the tools to be able to do that. Um, so we have a blog for those who savor which we feature a ton of different uh, recipes using our products. Um, twice a week we have um, a Snapchat story. Uh, one is Hummus Hacks and the other one is Toast Tuesday where we create really great content um, on the fly. Um, that you can do at home. Um, and then we also translate all that as well to Instagram and other platforms. Really, Kava, it becomes more of, more of your life than just where you eat your lunch. This is a way that we can find a way into your homes and into your lifestyles beyond just um, you know, a small occasion. Be passionate. So just like a person, we have a lot of passions. A brand can have a lot of passions too. So we love food, obviously, but we also love travel and fitness and music and culture, and we find ways to be able to express that through our imagery, through events, uh, and through our content. And really, you know, for us, that makes us a lot more interesting and also keeps people coming back for more because we're not boring. We have a, a lot of different content that we can rotate out. Um, and it gives us personality, just like any other person. Uh, we want you to get to know us. So, um, like I said, we have a great story. We come, these three guys in the middle here are our founders. Uh, they um, are all first generation Greek American and built Kava really from scratch um, starting about 10 years ago with our full service restaurant. They have an incredible story and we want to share their story, but even more so, there, there are people that our customers engage with on a regular basis that aren't those guys anymore. It's Ellie here on the left who is our cashier at our Chinatown restaurant in DC. And if you've ever gone through that restaurant, he has probably complimented you on your hair or your scarf or your shoes because he's the most friendly and outgoing person. And our customers know him and we want to share a little bit more about him with, with you. Um, and then Sarah and Sheila from Gordy's Pickle Jar, they're one of our, um, our food partners. Uh, when you're eating kava, you're also eating their food. Um, they have also have a great story to tell. Um, and we found that people really resonate with these stories, especially the ones of our team members. And we want you to get to know us because we also want to get to know you. So we, um, we celebrate every single interaction that we have um, with customers on social, especially, um, you know, for us, it's really exciting being the team that's not in the office. I mean, not in, we're in the office, not in the restaurant. So our restaurant team members get to interact with our customers every day. But when a customer takes the time to share an Instagram post about us um, or you know, post on, post on Facebook, we are really honored that they, they took the time to do that. So um, just a few examples. I love this one of just Kava, Grill and Chill. It's um, you know, a Saturday afternoon, something really easy, but we're part of their lives. Um, this was a really incredible um, post that um, a friend or two friends came to Kava Grill after one of them had her last chemotherapy session and beat cancer and talked, you know, all, all they really did was actually um, tag us in the post, um, tag that they were at Kava Grill. And then through commenting and um, a little bit of back and forth, we found out that Kava was um, healthy food that sustained her throughout her treatment, which was really incredible that we we're able to like be a part of somebody's life like that. So we don't take that lighthearted. We really want to, to celebrate that. Um, and I love this. We have a, uh, someone on Instagram who sends us DMs. She lives in 
San Francisco, but she DMs us um, empty locations that she wants us to open in. Um, and we get several different, she'll be just like driving around the neighborhood, this one's in Berkeley, and she wants Kava to come to San Francisco really badly. Um, so we love that. It's like really great that we can have um, fans that are so passionate, and we definitely um, find ways to celebrate those. Um, next, how do we scale all that? So I think um, the way I think about it is keeping it small while making it big. So we now have uh, 19, when I first started we had five locations, we now have 19, uh, next week will be number 20, um, in three regions with a whole lot of foodies. So that started from our first location in Bethesda, Maryland here, um, to a lot of uh, locations in DC, um, now in Los Angeles, and then I mentioned last month we opened our first location in New York City. Um, so how do we do that? How do we keep engaging all of these people? So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, New York City and how we kind of activated the community um, and our fans here um, about, it was about a month ago now. Uh, we opened in Union Square if anyone's interested in heading there later. Um, so a uh, couple things here, I'll get to the one on the left, but we, um, Again, we're really interested in keeping it local and keeping it small. Um, this is um, Aaron and Agatha from Ovenly. They create a, amazing cookies out of Greenpoint. Um, if you haven't tried them, you should. They're great. We, we found a partner that we believe shares our values in a lot of ways, and we wanted to be able to bring uh, their cookie to more people, and so we started partnering with them. We did tastings. Um, of our product at local businesses, like-minded businesses, like WeWork and SoulCycle and Equinox in the area to be able to actually get our product in front of them. Um, and then I love this um, thing that my team put together for our announcement of New York. We, over the last, really the last two years, we get people emailing us, um, sending us comments on a daily basis, come to New York, please come to New York. I love Kava, I used to live in DC, but now I live in New York and I wanna have, you know, I wanna have my Kava fix. We saved all those emails, we on Percolate, we tagged all of those comments from Twitter and Facebook with New York, and then when it got around to the time when we were actually able to announce that we were coming, uh, we put together this Instagram tile, so there are 12 images here, and when you open one up, uh, we actually, all the captions were, um, customers who were really who had said that they wanted us to come to New York so we saved those interactions from months and months ago um, and they're just regular people they weren't influencers they were just people who were really passionate about Kava and they really um, we had a really great reaction from those people who remembered that um, who saw that we remembered them and then in action so uh, we opened uh, the last week of August um, and with a few different um, different campaigns, we, we kind of blew that up. So first we did a Snapchat scavenger hunt, kept that really local with um, a countdown, um, and then also engaging people who lived and worked in the area with different clues to be able to win Kava prizes and things like that. Uh, we continued with tastings, we worked with influencers to get, um, to get our product out and get more um, some brand love and photos of Kava. And then all of these things culminated Crazily, um, I think the brand building that we've done over the past few years um, led to us having the opportunity to put a short video up on the NASDAQ screen in Times Square, and that ran for the whole weekend so, um, of our opening. So that was really great to be able to see all of those things really come together um, and continue to make it small while ma you know, making it big in New York. And so did we accomplish our goal um, in New York? I think, I think we did. We have um, now over 30,000 online fans and growing. Um, but I think what's even more important is that over that, that two weeks that we um, were engaging in New York, especially launching Kava Girl here, uh, we had over 150,000 points of engagement online. And that really shows to me that we had people who were really engaged with our brand and really wanted to um, be a part of what we're building. So in many ways, we're just getting started. Um, hopefully in a year or two, everybody in, their, in this room will raise their hands that they know what Kava is. Um, but our fans really get who we are um, and they, um, they're proud of how it's part of their life um, in different ways. You know, we, we serve everyday food, um, but people want to celebrate it in big ways and they want to keep sharing it. So that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki and Nancy. Uh, it's really great to be able to, you know, peer behind the curtain a little bit and see how your your great organizations are able to leverage social and technology and content um, to really, you know, in fact, build community and support community. 
Um, this, so this is a workshop. So in that spirit, we want to hear from you. Um, we want to take your questions for any of us. And if you have one, just raise your hand. Um, to get things started, um, I just wanted to dive a little bit deeper into some of your success metrics. So we're, we're in a space right now, and all of you out there probably understand this and feel this as well, where, where social is really heavily skewed toward paid and toward you know, business-oriented objectives. But how do you guys continue to balance the need for community engagement, sort of the organic side of the house, and how do you back into the start of a campaign from you know, using goals like these to, to justify you know, all those efforts that aren't paid and targeted but are you know, intended to reach people in, in a more organic, sort of natural way? You want to start? Sure, yeah. So if our, our goal is fundraising, raising those fundraising dollars, for the most part that happens at the end of the year. A lot of people, they're like, oh, i got to get my tax rebate. That's just people's schedule. So we spend the rest of the year building community, reminding people of who we are, what we do, that we understand what people are, are thinking. And um, especially for Facebook, we're able to set very specific goals for how much traffic we'd like to drive from Facebook, how many email addresses we'd like to acquire from that, that traffic. And we also do a lot of lead generation campaigns on Facebook. And it's the same for other channels like paid search. So we really see building community as a really important step toward reaching all of our goals at the end of the year. And just to push that a little further, mm -hmm. so you, you mentioned sort of those, those separate metrics or, or the goals for all those different you know, platforms. Um, are, are you able to put an actual value on them when, when leadership says, or when you say to leadership, we're going to be you know, activating or doing these campaigns, mm -hmm. are you able to walk in and say, we, we expect it to convert to X number of website you know, conversions or email subscribers or, or givers at the end of the year. Do you, do you actually have your finger on that yet? I think we're a little early in the process to have that. That's definitely the goal to be able to say, you know, when we lift traffic this much, eventually it translates into this much at the end of the year mm -hmm. and kind of the value of an email address for us as fundraisers. So that's definitely something that we're, we're working toward. But a nice thing about something like paid search is that's very easy to, to show ROI on because mm -hmm. um, so many donations do come through that channel, and it costs money, whereas with email, a lot of donations come through, but then it's like manpower and technology. It's a little harder to, to calculate. And, and what, about, what about you, Nikki? Is ROI still following you around uh, you know, in the business? Uh, a, a little bit, and it's starting to pick up a lot more. But I think in the beginning, as you guys saw, we, you know, if you set out the goal of really brand building as, as a foundation, and that's what a lot of our efforts up until this point has been is brand aware, uh, building and brand awareness, really giving people who want to. We know we have a lot of Kava fans out there, but not everybody wants to follow the place that they get their lunch on Instagram. It's not necessarily a, a big uh, connection for everybody. So we need to be able to, like, um, if you want to dive deeper, if you want to show that you are a fan in a little bit more, um, in a little, you know, a little bit more than normal than just showing up. Uh, we have a whole world for you to explore, and that's really what we've been we've been spending a lot of time on. Um, and that's where the the personalization comes into. And we know that if we can create a really great experience and respond to a comment, or um, you know, even pay it forward and give somebody some Kava credit for posting a really great photo, that in in turn can can really grow. Um, you know, most of what you know what we do right now is very much in a brick and mortar location, but you know our world is really shifting forward into digital ordering, um, ordering um, online, ordering on an app. So that's where my world is kind of shifting to in the next um, few months and few years, which I think uh, will kind of change that conversation of with ROI. Right, it's always evolving, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, so I'm keep my eye out for questions. I have, have another one that I wanted to ask you guys. Um, so it, I think one of the common threads in these presentations, and perhaps with content strategy in general, is this desire to defy expectations, right? For a brand to reveal something about itself that the casual observer didn't already know or a new customer um, didn't expect. So what tips or tricks or advice do you have for the content marketers in the room for how to go about achieving that in, in their organization? You want to start, Nikki? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, I, I kind of I gave that example a little bit of the, the tagging of New York, but I think that's something that can scale really well. Um, sometimes you don't know yet what 
what's down the line for you, what is going to be your next big product or where you're going to launch next or what is going to be a, a, a topic that you're going to need to discuss. But if you start thinking about segmenting out customers that way and tagging, that's something that has come around to us in a really great way. So um, anyone who has mentioned um, that they are vegetarian to us, we would love to be able to circle back around with them. Um, in a few months when we launch a new vegetable item on our menu and be able to give them some really um, personalized content for that and let them know that, hey, this is something that we remembered you by. Um, I think that's the way to do it in the less creepy marketing way and more so about just being super generous um, and, and personable, which is something that we, is a value that we have for our restaurant employees and we take and we put that onto our, our teams, our customer service and our, our social teams in house. So I would find ways to do that and think a little bit broadly about how, um, what are the things that you may communicate even if you don't really know and start, and start planning those things out because I think they'll come back around and you'll be able to really surprise people in that way. Nancy, what, what advice do you have? Yeah, I would say read the comments. You know, a lot of journalists and writers stay away from comment boxes, but I think as marketers, there's really a lot to learn in there. Mm -hmm. I, I know we go there a lot for content ideas, you know, what's confusing people, what are people struggling with in their daily lives, and then we use that information to create content that then performs really well. Awesome. There, there is a question here. Yeah, go ahead. So the question is about uh, going beyond own channels, distribution, earned media, for example? Yeah, or just, again, like getting, do you have more lifestyle content that's not directly related to the brand? So how are you getting the community that's engaged with Kava and even outside for just awareness purposes to consume that content? Yeah, um, so a couple things, I think, um, to answer that. One, um, I mentioned before, I think, you know, we, we put, like, for, I'll take Instagram for example. We post on Instagram at least twice a day. Um, people are going to get pretty bored if we just keep posting food photos every single day, even though a photo of Kava Pitas gets more likes than anything else. But I think uh, we need to be able to show that we, um, we can relate to people in a broader, uh, more meaningful way than just, um, hey, we share this one thing in common. So I think that's where we start, is that we want to be able to share um, more than just, um, than just um, food and what we serve at our restaurants. And there's so many more stories to tell beyond that. And we kind of seek those out, kind of what you're saying from the customer comments of what people are resonating to and not. And then I think the next level is kind of goes to partnerships and where, who are the people that we want to partner with um, to be able to get our message out a little bit more. And those partners um, for us are real life partners because um, somebody like, um, we work really closely with Equinox um, in all of our in all of our regions, and uh, they put on events. We help them with events. Um, their new members get uh, a free Kava card because it's kind of a a goodwill of hey, um, this is one of our favorite healthy places to eat. You guys should try it out. It's a really great partnership that we actually do in house. But I think the next part, or in like in real life, the next part is really finding out how do those content partnerships evolve online as well. Um, you know, working with their content teams and blogs and social to be able to amplify that, not just on our own, um, our own pages, but with our partners as well. So you think about um, somebody who, like Equinox, who is a, a partner um, for events, or you think of somebody like Ovenly in New York who has a great reach of um, passionate uh, fans who love their baked goods. They post about um, us as well, um, and suddenly we have a whole new community of people. So um, that's why partners to us are really important, and partners are part of marketing um, for us as well. I, I just wanted to pick up on, on earned media for a second. Uh, that's a phrase I don't think I've heard yet at this conference, which is interesting. Um, uh, maybe others have. But is, is earned media that car in the garage that has the cover on it that only goes out on, on a nice day, um, or, or is it something that's really important to your strategy? Do you find that? these community engagement opportunities are leveraged to get more earned media out there and therefore reach other communities that aren't following you on these own channels? Nancy, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think for us, sometimes our earned media you know, might be related to Michael J. Fox, or last year we had a lot of Back to the Future related coverage. But as far as just everyday kinds of stuff, we, we have an interesting clinical trial that's looking for people in the Ashkenazi Jewish population who might have this particular genetic mutation that predisposes them to Parkinson's. 
and we have been able to connect with a lot of very small Jewish, pop, uh, Jewish publications to get coverage for this study, and that's been really great for increasing recruitment. So I think even getting earned media in those very sm small but targeted niches ha has been really powerful for us. And do either of you host any events or engagements with the media to try and you know um, get them more educated or involved in what you're doing? Yeah, um, yeah our uh, media events are dinners, uh, so that's a, a fun thing to be able to put on. For example, uh, this spring we launched a new uh, lamb product. We're working with a shepherd out of Virginia, um, which really creates, uh, it's called Border Springs Lamb. If you eat at any fine dining restaurant in New York or in D.C., somewhere on the East Coast, um, and you, have, you order lamb, you're likely ordering um, Craig Rogers' um, fantastic um, lamb. And we were able to work a partnership out with him where um, to be able to sell it um, at Kava Grill at a much lower price point um, and give that to, to many more people. So um, that's an opportunity for us to not only just like tell a story, hey, there's lamb, um, we have some great blog content about that. Um, and we have, um, you know, obviously some really great messaging that happens in store with our, um, our team members, but we want to get the product in front of people too. So we hosted a really um, great uh, five course lamb dinner with our chef. Um, and some select media in DC. Um, and that's something that um, you have a little bit more of an intimate relationship there. You're able to tell that story. Um, Craig, the shepherd's able to tell it himself. Our chef is able to tell why, you know, when he first learned how to butcher a lamb when he was five years old. Um, and that stuff kind of comes to life um, over food and over a gathering, which is what we do really well. Um, so I think that's something that we are looking to scale as we grow too. Let's come back to Percolate for a second. So can you guys talk about how the tool has um, influenced any organizational change um, at, your, at your companies? Uh, has it made life easier, more efficient? What, what, what's the difference now than before you had the tool? I think it's definitely made it easier for us to <coughs> connect with our communications team. So you know, we could, the marketing team controls all of our social content, but we do like to get eyes on it. And with all those emails going back and forth, it's just so much easier to, to tag people and percolate. So, and I think that has really contributed to our two teams working together more frequently overall, which is nice. Yeah, I think uh, we have a team of now of 16, and that's um, everything from social to events uh, to art and design, and Percolate puts us all in one place, um, especially when we have brand managers in uh, New York and uh, Los Angeles and also in Chicago. And so th it allows us to kind of all meet in, in one place. So I'm really excited about the templates. Um, we're going to start doing that re uh, really soon. Uh, when we have, uh, a, next year we'll have a new store opening almost every other week. Um, we're going to need uh, the, that system in place so that we can all do our jobs, um, but also have the space in the room to be able to do big things outside of just execute the daily work, too. Yeah, I definitely want to echo that. If you missed the announcement yesterday, um, Percolate is rolling out um, campaign templates. So for a school like Wharton, um, we are in a cycle that's the same cycle year over year. So the ability to go back and sort of uh, you know, use and repurpose existing campaigns and just make those you know, small tweaks or change the assets out is incredibly helpful. So we're really excited about that. The announcement is on Percolate's blog. Uh, they pushed that out yesterday, so check it out. Um, you can read more about it there, plus some analytics um, you know, features that are rolling out as well. We have time for one more question here, maybe two. Why don't we start with Nikki and work, work our way around to, to me, and then I'll wrap things up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the question was essentially, um, you know, who manages all these teams? There's a lot of, you know, from email to social media to, um, you know, content that goes on your site and other own channels. Who, how do you manage all of that in-house? Is that essentially the question? Okay. Who's responsible? Uh, yeah, it's something that's always evolving um, and, and changing. So uh, when you know when I started, it was just me, and now we have a group of people who can help. Uh, help plan that out. So we have a, an art team, so that's uh, photography, graphic design, um, and video. And then we have a content team, which is um, strategy, social, and copywriting. 
Uh, and then we also have an experiential marketing team, which is everything that's kind of done in the field, um, including those partnerships and relationships. So um, they're segmented that way. Uh, oh, and then we also have customer experience, customer service as well. So I would say those are the four teams that we've kind of segmented in. Um, and the leads of those teams work really closely, especially on Percolate, to make sure all of the relevant information is needed um, and is in one place um, so that other teams can access it. You know, customer service is one of those things that um, someone in social may need to know and someone in the field may need to know, and we need to be able to put those, those things all in place. But that's what it is right now. I don't know if it will stay that way. It's, it's always changing. If anyone has suggestions later on how they structure their team, I'm in the market for ideas. Um, I'm a little jealous of Nikki's team structure. <laughs> I think that sounds great. Um, for us, we the marketing team is pretty new at the foundation. We're part of a larger digital strategies team, so our group also has web developers and analytics uh, people. So the, the, our three groups work really closely together on the digital side, but then our blog and email content is actually created by our communications team. So sometimes we have to have kind of awkward moments where the communications team will say like, oh, look at this beautiful email we wrote. And we say, the marketing team says, can we put a giant donate button right in the middle of that? <laughs> so just dealing with, with that kind of thing but, and just respecting each other's goals and, and workflows can be challenging, but I, I think it, it's gotten better over time. And, and, and Wharton's not that much different. Creative services, all of our design, marketing technology, you know, all the back end from CRM to automated marketing, uh, web optimization, SEO. Um, social, obviously, and analytics is actually in, in my org, so analytics rolls up to me, which is awesome. I love that. Um, and then we have our content team, so all the folks writing our blog posts, doing our videos. Um, they actually manage our Snapchat, too, which is interesting. Snapchat's not reporting directly to me. Snapchat's part of our storytelling team, so um, that's a little unusual, but it really works for us. Uh, the other thing I would add, well, so who runs it? The CMO. That's why it gets paid the big bucks. So all of us roll up to the CMO, his job to keep the ship going in the right direction. Um, but technology is huge. We're, we geek out about technology. One example is, in addition to Percolate, we use Slack. So Slack allows our team to collaborate on everything. We have lots of channels for different initiatives. But the Stories channel, everyone's on. And we've actually recently integrated If Then Then That, IFTTT, so that whenever a new blog post or YouTube video goes up, it automatically, through a bot, gets sent to everyone on that distribution. So they get a notification on their phone or on their desktop that, hey, there's a new video. You need to leverage that. You know, or hey, there's a new blog post, go read it. We might want to pitch it to the media. Um, and Percolate, of course, has tasking. So all of that stuff, when it gets published, is also tasked to different team members if there's something specific they need to follow through on. So we like to have coverage, and we like to make sure that we're all in the same, in the same boat uh, and aware of, of what's going on at any given time. So. Well, if there's no other questions, I want to thank you guys again for coming. Thank you to, to Percolate and Transition for having us. It's been a wonderful event. Um, take care, and please follow up with us if you have any, any questions. Thank you. Thank you.